Well, good evening, uh, everybody, or rather a good day uh, over there in North America. Uh, and uh, I'm Jamie Shea, the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, and I'm sitting here in the studio uh, at NATO headquarters in Brussels, and it's going to be my pleasure uh, over the next uh, hour uh, to moderate this uh, discussion where we're going to be looking very much at the transatlantic bond and the view, the perspective from North America about some of the issues currently facing the Atlantic Alliance. Uh, often we Europeans always uh, think of uh, what it is that we as Europeans expect Canada and the United States to do for us. Uh, but this evening is somewhat different because we're going to be hearing essentially from uh, two ambassadors, uh, the Ambassador of Canada, the Ambassador of the United States here at NATO, uh, on what they believe Europe also uh, should contribute to the alliance, but also why uh, NATO is still important for Canada uh, and the United States. Uh, in order to have uh, a, a good discussion on NATO, you need three essential ingredients. The first thing is you need good speakers and good commentators. And here I'm absolutely delighted to welcome, first of all, Ambassador Yves Brodeur, the Ambassador of uh, Canada uh, uh, to NATO uh, uh, since 2011. Uh, Eve, I know, uh, has a long and distinguished uh, diplomatic career, which even uh, included uh, earlier on a time uh, as a colleague of mine on the international staff uh, here at NATO when he was the Director of Communications and the Spokesman. So, Eve, good to see you uh, here this evening. Uh, and Ambassador okay. Doug Lute, uh, the Permanent Representative of the United States. He's been here a little bit shorter uh, so far than, than Eve, but he has a very long and distinguished uh, track record in handling international security affairs. Uh, first of all, a 35-year career uh, in the United States Army, and after 2007, uh, service in the White House, where he was very much the, the key coordinator, the key point man, assisting the U.S. presidents and both a Republican and a, a Democratic administration, which I think says a lot uh, about your <coughs> expertise, uh, Doug, uh, dealing with Afghanistan and Iraq. So we've got two very uh, good practitioners when it comes not just to NATO, but international security. The second ingredient that you need for a good discussion is obviously a good audience. And, and here I'm absolutely delighted to welcome, uh, via the miracles of VTC technology, uh, four uh, university audiences in North America. First of all, we should have online uh, the Norman Patterson School for International Relations and the Department of Political Science from uh, Carleton University in Ottawa, uh, headed up uh, this evening by Dane Rowland, uh, director of the Norma Patterson School. So, Dane, if you're there, a uh, warm welcome to you and your students. Secondly, we should have, uh, representing the U.S. interest uh, this evening, uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at, at Tufts University, just outside uh, 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 Boston, uh, with uh, an old friend of all of us, uh, Professor uh, uh, Robert Fultzgraf, uh, uh, who uh, is with the International Security Studies Program there. Bob, good to see you again. And as we've recently given to you uh, over there at Fletcher, our recent Supreme Allied Commander Europe, uh, uh, Admiral Jim Stavridis as your dean, uh, I'm expecting that your questions should be particularly well informed uh, this <laughs> evening. But we've also got uh, back to Canada, uh, Queen's University, uh, Kingston, Ontario, uh, where David Hagland, he's not with us this evening, but has been a distinguished NATO scholar for many years, so I expect too, uh, Queens, that your questions would also be very good and to the point. Uh, and finally, if all has worked out well, uh, we should have the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, Ontario, uh, which, at least in my experience, organizes one of the best annual cyber uh, conferences. So we're certainly very well served. Uh, and I also salute the fact that we have uh, three Canadian uh, universities uh, this tonight out of four, which I think is a healthy, if I may say so, rebalancing of our transatlantic uh, relationship. The, the third ingredient uh, is we've got to have an interesting topic, and I think that NATO at the moment, certainly uh, this would not be a controversial thing to say, is at an interesting stage of its history and an interesting uh, uh, times. Um, and therefore, what I'd like to do is to begin is to, to ask uh, both uh, uh, Ambassador Brodeur uh, and Ambassador Lute to begin with some sort of reflections on the current state of the alliance. And uh, I imagine, gentlemen, if I could start, uh, and turning Eve, if I may, to you first, I mean, when you sort of woke up that morning and discovered that, uh, beyond doubt, Russian forces were uh, in Crimea, and then we went 
forward to the annexation, the illegal annexation of Crimea, and now all of the pressures and turbulence that we see I in eastern Ukraine. What, what were your thoughts in terms of uh, the future of NATO, uh, Canada's likely sort of take on all of this, your, your own work uh, uh, as ambassador? Did you think that this was an inflection point where everything, all of the existing agenda, Afghanistan, new challenges, NATO partnerships needed to be re re rethought? Or did you think that this was something that sort of had to be accommodated along with all of the agenda as NATO heads up to its Wales summit. So I'd like to ask you to, to kick us off and give us your sort of take on that, and then I'll turn to Ambassador Lute. Okay, thank you very much, Jamie. First of all, if, uh, if I may, I'd like to uh, uh, say hello to all uh, the who actually are uh, taking part into this, uh, this video conference. I'm very pleased to be uh, here uh, uh, tonight for us, I guess, uh, uh, and, and, and half day for, or midday for you. Um, it's, uh, it's really also important and interesting uh, that uh, the two uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, allies who are sitting on the other side of the Atlantic are sitting here tonight uh, talking uh, about the, uh, the North American perspective to NATO. Uh, it doesn't happen uh, all that often that uh, we sit together uh, and exchanging on issues related to NATO. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, as we mark the 66th, 65th anniversary of NATO, uh, and, uh, and Canada was actually one of the, uh, the nations uh, which were uh, uh, at the origin of this, uh, this, this concept. Uh, for me, I guess my reaction was, well, NATO is certainly as relevant now as it was back in 1949 when our two countries actually uh, signed the, uh, what is now uh, uh, known as the Washington Treaty. So for me, uh, it, I, I don't know if it's an inflection point, but it certainly, uh, uh, again, uh, or it underlines the fact that NATO uh, is uh, really uh, the only and probably the primary security organization that brings together the two sides of the Atlantic, Europeans and North Americans, to talk about issues which are extremely relevant to our global security. Uh, and uh, in a way, it reinforces the relevance of the agenda. Uh, I think it, it, re it reinforces the, uh, uh, how should I put it, uh, the um, uh, importance for us to actually uh, develop an agenda that is really uh, in line with uh, uh, with the new threats and uh, and also with the new challenges uh, that we're faced with, and uh, and there's no other uh, organization that uh, like NATO and uh, as successful as NATO has been uh, so far. Um, and lastly, I just want to uh, point out that uh, Canada uh, has been uh, and is and re will remain a very committed ally. Uh, very recently, uh, we just, uh, Prime Minister Harper just announced uh, that uh, uh, we're going to uh, contribute mm -hmm. uh, to the reassurance package uh, for our uh, East European allies. Uh, we're going to deploy uh, six F-18s. Uh, there's a number of uh, 20 uh, military planners which are being sent to shape to augment uh, shape uh, planning capacity. And uh, certainly for us, it is a demonstration of our commitment to this alliance, uh, which uh, has always been there uh, and, and, and will not change. Thank you, uh, Eve. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Lute, I've heard you in the North Atlantic Council argue very persuasively and even passionately for the importance of Afghanistan and a continued NATO commitment there, even after the end of ISAF. So how do the events in Ukraine reflect your own thinking about the future uh, role of NATO? And if I may also, I think something that the viewers may like to hear, the U.S. has been very prominent uh, so far uh, in the reassurance package that Ambassador Broder referred to by sending aircraft and troops uh, to Eastern Europe which have been very well received, uh, do you think that the Europeans are stepping up to the plate? Uh, we've heard about the North American contribution, uh, but are you satisfied with what the European allies are doing? Over to you, sir. Well, that's a good set of questions, uh, Jamie. Let me uh, just take a second, though, to reflect back on uh, a point that, uh, that uh, Ambassador Brodeur made, and this had to do with the 65-year history of the alliance. And, and then your initial question about at the 65-year mark, is 2014 somehow an inflection point? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and just give a bit of a historical context here, and then I, I think maybe this will frame up uh, and open up uh, the potential for discussion. As I look at the 65 years of NATO history, uh, I, I really break it down into three phases. So I think we're at the end of phase three. Let me unpack this for you. Uh, the first 40 years are pretty clean cut. Yeah. Uh, this is from 49 to 89, Cold War, Central Front, uh, right here uh, in Europe. Uh, had everything to do with deterring and, if necessary, defeating uh, an attack from, uh, from the East by the Soviet Union. 
Uh, and that's what the alliance did for uh, the first 40 years of its life. Then, quite unexpectedly, uh, it entered into a short phase two. This is from roughly from the fall of the Berlin Wall. I count it to sometime in 1994. Mm -hmm. So a five-year period of transition right. where the alliance transitioned away from its raison d'etre of the Cold War and sort of asked itself very seriously, what now? Uh, and uh, what, uh, what is it that, uh, that the alliance will take on, given that the Soviet Union has, uh, has dissolved? Uh, about 94, we entered into what uh, I call phase three, which is a 20-year period of uh, continuous operation. So you might call this the operational phase. It began early in the Balkans. So in 95, we went across the Sava River into Bosnia. Uh, but it was quickly followed by further operations in the Balkans in Kosovo, uh, and then maritime operations in the Med, uh, off the coast in Somalia, uh, the largest, longest ever combat operation in Afghanistan, uh, and then some one-off operations like the short, sharp operation in Libya. So it, this year, in 2014, we were going to face the end of, or potentially the end of what I call phase three, the operational phase, before Ukraine. Um, so we were already looking at 2014 and the summit, which we're all anticipating the first week in September in Wales. Uh, to assess this question of what's next. Yeah. So again, say maybe for the second time in the alliance's history, um, ask ourselves this sort of existential question. Uh, and as we headed into that summit, we imagined three big summit agenda items. And I'll just outline these quickly because I think they'll frame somewhat the questions from, uh, yeah. from our uh, VTC yeah. partners here. The first one is the one that's obvious, and that's Afghanistan. Uh, because December 2014 marks the end mm. of combat operations for us, in Afghanistan, it was going to be the question of what's next. Yeah. Uh, the second had to do with military capabilities. Uh, so the second agenda item on the summit was is going to address which military capabilities do we assess that we should prioritize based on this last 20 years of operational experience? Which ones do we need the most? And coming out of six years of global recession across the democracies in the alliance, which ones can we afford? So if we can't afford everything, mm -hmm. What does our experience and what do our budgets tell us about what we should be investing in in terms of military capabilities? And then the third question, I think, that was already on the agenda for the Wales Summit has to do with partnerships. Yeah. Because not only did we operate nonstop for the last 20 years, but in that 20-year experience, we've collected 40 operational partners. So sitting alongside the 20 NATO allies are 40 other countries who have expressed a political interest and have operated alongside of NATO in uh, any one of these series of operations. The best example of this is Afghanistan today, where you have the 28 allies operating alongside 22 operational partners. So for General Joe Dunford's ISAF command in Afghanistan, there are 50 countries. Mm -hmm. And that's the power that demonstrates briefly the power of partnerships. But what happens when you don't have ISAF a and you don't have day-to-day -day operational laboratories for partners. What attracts partners in the future to work with NATO, and what does NATO get out of these partnerships? So I think those three agenda items predate uh, the, uh, the Ukraine experience. Uh, we were going to talk about Afghanistan, uh, we were going to talk about capabilities, and we we're going to talk about partnerships. Now, obviously, almost two months ago, precisely today, uh, we were awakened uh, on some, I think it actually was a Friday, um, with this new question of, uh, all right, uh, how do you contend with the unexpected? And how do you contend with the illegal annexation of Ukraine and now the continuing uh, intimidation uh, and introduction of political and security instability in, uh, in eastern Ukraine? Um, and, of course, I think that's probably best left to the questions because this will undoubtedly come out. Come but through. we can address what NATO's doing now uh, in sort of a set of immediate measures in response to, uh, to Russia's moves in, uh, in th that region. But we could also uh, begin to forecast some of the steps that we think NATO will take in the, in the immediate and longer term. All of these, though, suggest that there's now a fourth agenda item on right. the summit. And clearly, Ukraine has elbowed its way mm -hmm. uh, onto the agenda in a very prominent way. So with that, uh, I just want to say uh, hello to two old friends that are on the screen. Absolutely. You know, you this is like the, uh, uh, the announcement to your mother, you know, if you ever. <laughs> uh, one is to Ambassador Bruce Heyman there in mm -hmm. Ottawa. And uh, Bruce, uh, uh, it's good to see you on the screen. And also to, uh, to Bob Falsgraf, who uh, 30 years ago uh, was uh, teaching me about uh, European security matters uh, as a, a student at Fletcher. 
And uh, so for all you Fletcher students, if you wonder how bad you're going to look in 30 years, <laughs> uh, you know, you can only look on the camera today and, and get a hint of what it's going to look like. Uh, well, I certainly think that Bob Foolscraft could take a lot of pride uh, from, from, from that because he obviously had a, a very good student in you, Doug. Uh, We've had the two ambassadors set the stage for us uh, very well, uh, but as I've said, this program is all about the students and your ability, your willingness to come forward and ask uh, uh, questions. Uh, you've had the issues, I think, very succinctly described, the challenge of uh, Russia, uh, of Crimea, of Ukraine, uh, but also the fact that the old agenda hadn't gone to sleep. Afghanistan is still there, Al-Qaeda is not in hibernation, the rest of the world is not going to go away, and that therefore NATO has to be able to handle the three core tasks still of collective defense, crisis management, cooperative security. Uh, with that, uh, let me also welcome all those who are joining us this evening uh, through uh, live uh, streaming, the digital viewers out there. Thank you again for your participation. And let me now, if I may, go to the first uh, school, uh, uh, Norman Patterson School, uh, up there in uh, Carlton. Uh, and I've already introduced Dane Rowland. Dane, if you're there, could you please introduce your student uh, and ask her or him uh, to please put the uh, question uh, that you have to our two ambassadors. Again, welcome. Over to you, please. We don't. We can see you very well, but apparently there's a problem of, of the of the sound. Let's see if we can resolve this. Hello, Dane. Can you hear us at least? If not, should we switch? Maybe yes. Let let's. Uh, we've obviously had a sound problem with Colton. So if I may, let's go uh, to uh, Fletcher. Uh, uh, Bob, you've already been very, Bob Forscraft, abundantly introduced, so if you are able to hear us and if the sound is working at your end, could you please go forward with your question and we'll obviously return to Colton a little bit later on. Please. Well, well thank you very much. I hope you can hear me yeah, and, yeah, and I can certainly hear you. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to see so many friends after so many years and uh, Doug, you have not changed at all. You look wonderful, <laughs> just, so, just so you know. So I, I wanted to, uh, to mention one thing, and I wanted to say that we have not only taken one secure uh, from, uh, from you, but we have taken two. Uh, remember Jack Galvin, who was here in the late 1990s. We have, of course, as everyone knows, a very strong uh, transatlantic relationship with many uh, distinguished uh, alumni, uh, including Joe, Joe Dunford, whose name was mentioned just a moment ago, who is one of ours as well. But I, uh, and I have a group here of uh, at least 10 uh, students uh, who would like, if possible, to ask questions. But I would just begin with one question for you, which builds upon uh, what Ambassador Lute was saying. Uh, and uh, that uh, question is, uh, uh, how uh, does uh, the Ukraine uh, experience of the last uh, several weeks and months uh, shape uh, the thinking uh, uh, at NATO uh, on the types of military capabilities that we will need uh, in the future. Uh, Bob, thanks a lot. That was the, uh, an, an expert question I anticipated, and we'll, we'll also try to give the opportunity to the students as well. But let's at least, uh, uh, it was to you, Ambassador Luke, ask sure. for your response on that. You may wish to come in as well. Thank well, thanks for that. Um, it's clear to see that the, capabil the military capabilities that Russia is employing in First Crimea and now uh, in a slightly different way in, um, in eastern Ukraine are a pretty complex blend of uh, sort of high-end niche capabilities which are all uh, subtle uh, to one extent or another and very different than sort of the old conventional model against which NATO used to do its force planning. So you have here a blend of special operations forces uh, disguised or in uh, sort of deniable uh, settings you have uh, a complex web of electronic warfare, uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks, and then a, uh, some reinforcement in the form of Crimea, on the ground in Crimea, of conventional, even armored forces. And in the case of eastern, uh, eastern Ukraine, you have some 40,000 conventional forces amassed, uh, playing a role of political intimidation just across the border in, uh, in western uh, Russia. 
So I think the, the question here for NATO is, and, and this is one that we're just really coming to grips with as we come through this immediate response phase uh, to the crisis, is are, are we postured uh, appropriately to take on this kind of threat in the future? Because, you know, Ukraine and Crimea are not just one-off cases where you have, um, you have Russian speaking, um, Russian, uh, ethnic Russian uh, populations that are minority populations uh, across uh, across Eastern Europe. In fact, in some NATO allied states, I was in Estonia over the weekend, there's a 25% Russian speaking population in Estonia today. Uh, and most prominently, the third largest city, Narva, up in the very northeast extreme of Estonia, is uh, sits right, along, right astride the border uh, with Russia. So this is a this is a set of capabilities that Russia has brought to bear that are very sophisticated, uh, a very sophisticated blend, and are really t quite tough to, to uh, combat. Um, and I think we'll have to come to grips with this. Now, elements of that set uh, we're already working on. So for example, cyber defense is a big NATO uh, priority because um, we've seen it before. Uh, we appreciate that that's an emerging threat. But I can't tell you uh, today, Professor, that at the sort of two-month mark that we've got our hands around how to contend with this complex uh, blend of conventional, unconventional, uh, political pressure, uh, and uh, in some cases, just the, uh, just the, the use of thuggery, um, a local thuggery, uh, that, uh, that really defies a conventional alliance response. This would be something, this is, I think, on our, on our list to, uh, to work on in the, in the coming weeks. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to get Eve's take on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please, Ambassador Rowe. And if I may, just to chip in, just to build on Professor Fultzgraf's question, I, I know that in North America, people have been a bit concerned about declining European defense budgets in recent years. Do you think, therefore, now the need for reassurance, the need for NATO to demonstrate its credibility will maybe lead to a reversal of those declining defense budgets? Are you hopeful in that uh, domain? Yeah, well, uh, before I answer that one, I just want to actually uh, 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 add to what Ambassador Lude said. I, I do agree uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, perspective that uh, uh, he described. I think that uh, for NATO, what also is important is that we need to have a better understanding of how uh, the Russians are, are, are working. Essentially, I think, uh, and, and uh, I, I would, this is certainly my view, uh, we're all a little surprised with the speed and, and the agility uh, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the cleverness of how uh, they moved uh, uh, in, in Crimea, but also uh, around Ukraine. And uh, it's not only about uh, capacity as in uh, assets and, and uh, you, know, you know, conventional weapons and, and cyber and others. It's also about, uh, the, uh, as you said, the complexity, the combination of this. And I think that in many ways, uh, what I heard is that uh, we, we, we had a bit underestimated uh, the, the Russian capacity to do that. So we have to, to really sort of sit down and, and study this carefully so we know exactly what we're dealing with here. Uh, on the issue of, of uh, uh, you know, declining defense budget, uh, whenever I, I hear that, uh, uh, I always, uh, I'm always tempted to talk about, you know, uh, how well we spend the money we've yeah, got, which is a question it, yeah. that actually uh, is slightly different, mm -hmm. but still very, I think, uh, relevant. Um, it's not, uh, and, and here no, no challenge or no dispute about the fact that, you know, indeed uh, defense budgets are actually mm -hmm. smaller than, than they were uh, and significantly in some uh, instances. But I think we also have as an alliance to uh, think a bit about how we're using what we've got, which is mm -hmm. not insignificant uh, in terms of, you know, aggregated uh, defense yeah. budgets uh, overall. Up, yeah. And uh, are we getting what we need uh, in terms of, of, of uh, impact, uh, results, effect? Uh, are we having the right priorities? Are we really targeting uh, the right assets? Are we doing what we need to do in terms of uh, training, exercising? And, and this is uh, all uh, not only about, you know, again, uh, putting more money uh, in the bank but or, in, you know, on the table, but it's rather about, you know, uh, doing the right thing. And I think that there's still scope, a lot of it. A lot of room to, uh, for yes, to improve that and, and uh, make a better job at it. So. Uh, so for me, yes, it's a combination of uh, having to uh, have a serious look at, you know, the, the money we invest in our defense, but also how we, we, uh, we use that. And to me, that's a discussion that is um, uh, uh, a little new to NATO, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and we'll have to do better on that front. So it's so not just what you spend, but how you spend. Well, that's right. Now, uh, let me just add on this defense spending uh, question. It's much more sophisticated. It's a much more complex question than a simple 2% benchmark. Um, I mean, we, we've already discussed that we're coming out of 
12 consecutive years of operations in Afghanistan. So monies, defense monies spent on operational recurring costs in Afghanistan uh, will be much decreased uh, beginning, uh, beginning next year. So how are those monies that are freed up from operational expenses reinvested elsewhere? And, and I think more broadly, we need to track the progress of the macroeconomic recovery out of a six-year recessional period. And do defense budgets keep pace with GDP recovery growth, uh, or do they continue to lag? Or in some cases, do they further decline? And these things are all, this is all public knowledge. I mean, we can track this pretty carefully. Yeah. So what I think is really important for the alliance is as we come out of Afghanistan, we come out of a period of, of tight budgets across the board, do defense budgets make progress on par with national progress against growth of GDP? Hopefully the economists pick up. Bob, I think you've got a very full answer there, but you also mentioned, just while we have you on the line and we know that you can hear us and speak to us, you also mentioned uh, some of your students would like to ask a question. We're going to have to move fairly quickly to Canada, but I wanted to give one of your students at least the opportunity also to ask a question. So is anybody in Fletcher uh, ready to uh, put the question to the two ambassadors? Bob, back to you. So who would like to ask the question? Um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you say who you are, please, ma'am? Excellent. My name is Caroline Truon. I'm a second year candidate um, in the Masters of Law and Diplomacy program here at Fletcher. And I wanted to ask, since we have two Arctic countries here, and we're speaking about a very large third Arctic country, to what extent do the ambassadors think that the Arctic might be used as a proxy, and what steps do NATO, does NATO need to take in that? Uh, good to have you with us, Caroline, and a very good question. I'll turn first of all to Ambassador Brodeur because, as you rightly say, Canada has very strong interest in this uh, part yeah, of the world. Co coming from Fletcher, uh, why is it I'm not surprised the question <laughs> comes up there? I guess uh, I owe it to my uh, good friend, uh, Jim Sliverges. Um, uh, for us, I guess, from a uh, Canadian perspective, uh, things haven't really changed. I think that uh, uh, at the end of the day, true, I mean, Russians are uh, actually paying more attention to the Arctic, but so are we. Uh, in Canada, certainly, and I think the same is true for the uh, United States. Uh, and uh, uh, to this day, there is no real uh, evidence that there's rising tension in the Arctic. So, uh, and as long as it's the case, and as long as actually all the players, which are the coastal Arctic coastal nations, uh, are uh, actually uh, at least indicating that their intent is to uh, solve their claim uh, to uh, the existing legal mechanisms, uh, UN and all that, I think it might actually uh, be uh, uh, misguided for us to raise NATO's profile in the Arctic, and that's certainly our view. We haven't changed that. That said, we keep a very close watch on what's happening there, uh, and uh, uh, I think that you know uh, uh, we'll have to adapt as uh, the circumstances warrant it. But right now, as we speak today, uh, we don't see a need for us to change uh, our position on that. Okay. Any thoughts on no thoughts? Or no, I think we'll leave the Arctic. We'll leave right the there. Arctic. I mean, but it's a it's a fair question. I <laughs> just mentioned that it's it not is. just the three countries uh, alluded That's to in the in the question. It's actually five. Yes, so there's indeed. NATO, uh, another NATO ally, and a NATO partner who mm -hmm. are also uh, mm -hmm. very intimately uh, involved here. So, so it, but it's not right now on the sort of front uh, priority list of, of, of NATO as an organization. Uh -huh. can, can I just maybe add Yeah, please. This? Sorry, this is a, a, mm -hmm. a real fun issue for me. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, one also has to uh, consider, uh, the, uh, notwithstanding the context, the, uh, the, the reality of, of the Arctic. And uh, you're looking at uh, 14 million square kilometers of uh, uh, hostile environments, uh, ice, uh, sea, etc. Uh, and, and it's a question of capacity, and, it, it, and the question of capacity applies to, to, uh, to NATO allies as it applies to Russia as well. So, uh, uh, and I think for us it's a question of uh, also priority. Where do we want to invest the time, effort, and resources, and where is it urgent for us to do that? And I would argue that uh, the Arctic is not necessarily at the top of the, uh, the list right now. Okay. Uh, many thanks indeed, Fletcher, for those questions. So please stay on the line, and I'll try, hopefully, time permitting, to come back to you. But now we'd like to move north of the, uh, the border. Uh, Queens, please, I, I hope you're still, still there. Uh, and uh, I'd like, uh, uh, please, uh, to turn to Professor uh, Stephanie Van Latke. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Professor. Uh, if you would kindly like to introduce your students uh, and also their, their questions, please. 
Thank you very much for including Queens in the session. Uh, we have a student here who is an MA candidate in the Department of Political Studies. His name is Christopher Radiuski, and he has a question for the ambassadors. Thanks, uh, Christopher. Thank, thank you. you, Professor. Christopher, over to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shea, and uh, thank you, ambassadors. Uh, my question uh, looks to sort of the decision-making structure. Uh, how does NATO make decisions that reflect the variety of political opinions of member states, particularly as disputes are equally uh, viewed regionally and globally, uh, but perceived distinctly by each member states? So, for example, I mean, Germany and Canada may view the situation in Ukraine differently, and then uh, responses, uh, appropriate responses may be different as well. So, and then I guess the follow-up would be, um, how, how does this change when you're trying to achieve a common strategy when the uh, issue or event is very time sensitive? Okay, well, those are very good questions. You have good questions, and you have here two practitioners of the art of getting to consensus. So, who would like to sort of describe the process first? Well, let me take a stab at it as, uh, as the newcomer, and then I'll, I'll turn to a NATO veteran here in, in Yves Baudour. Um, the power of NATO is solidarity at 28, um, but that's also the decision making challenge. Uh, and that's because this is a consensus-based decision-making process. So we don't take a decision, uh, a affirmative decision or negative decision on anything uh, that's not at consensus. If you don't reach consensus, there's no decision. So now you might say, well, gosh, at 28, can you imagine 28 of your classmates getting together, 28 of your family members getting together to try to order pizza or something, right? It's very <laughs> – decision-making can get pretty difficult. Um, but it actually is – it is also the power of the alliance because this is a serious – this is serious business. This is a military alliance. Uh, this is an alliance that survived a lot of challenges in its 65-year history. Uh, it's a mature uh, bureaucratic in institution. And as a deliberate, mature body, uh, it takes work to get across that threshold of 28. But the power of it is that once you're across that threshold, you've got great solidarity and you have uh, sustainable legitimacy, political legitimacy, because you went through the groundwork to bring 28 nations together. So you pay some in terms of quickness of decision making and flexibility of decision making, but you pick up a big dividend on the backside once the decision is taken by way of legitimacy. Yeah, if I if can add to that, uh, I think it's a very, very good question, excellent one. I think we could probably spend you know, a couple of days uh, talking about decision making at NATO, yeah. but the, the key word is, is what uh, uh, Dr. Shea mentioned, which is consensus. And this is actually what, what always struck me uh, uh, at NATO is, is the capacity of this organization to actually forge consensus. And, uh, and NATO delivers uh, all the time. I, I, I have to uh, try and hard to find uh, or remember a moment where we actually disagreed so vigorously that we couldn't agree to, uh, to anything at all or would not actually make a decision. We do. And uh, uh, indeed, you know, when you're 28 around the table, then uh, sometimes it takes a little longer to arrive at a consensus. But uh, actually, at the end of the day, we, we do arrive at consensus. And, and I think that precisely because uh, we have something in common here, uh, which is uh, a, our common security. And, and really, uh, every nation around the table uh, takes it uh, uh, very seriously, as Ambassador Lute said. Uh, and uh, everyone actually wants, at the end, to arrive at a decision uh, which will satisfy uh, uh, everyone, but which also meet our uh, uh, collective desire for uh, an, an end security. So, uh, in a way, I guess if you look at, uh, uh, you know, to, to take a very concrete example, uh, NATO is extremely unified, very uh, actually uh, united, sorry, on, on the question of, uh, of uh, uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. Uh, ministers came here two weeks ago, foreign ministers issued a statement which is really clear. Uh, in the position of this organization, despite the fact that indeed we had some interesting discussions about uh, the the emphasis that we want to put on certain elements of this thing, so it works. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a very interesting process, at times challenging, but uh, at the end of the day, I think we're all uh, uh, into this together, and uh, the the notion of common security is still a very strong driver for us to arrive at a decision. So Let me just add, if, if I may, Jamie, to, to Eve's point. It's not, it is very much, as, as Eve said, the, this notion of we're in this together for a common yeah. cause, which is common defense. But beyond that, we tend to come for, uh, at these questions from basically the same uh, political value set yeah. because <coughs> we are all democracies. So it's, it's not only we're all in this together for mm -hmm. common defense, 
well, we're 28 democracies working together. So, so when you come together and you take on tough questions, you're really coming at them from very much common perspective. So the old criticism, w w which used to be that the larger NATO became, the harder it would be to reach a consensus, or the, the more the security scene became diverse with different challenges, the more allies would take a different view of the threats. In reality, that hasn't really sort of happened, has it? I think it just makes the uh, dynamic perhaps a bit more uh, uh, complex and, and more interesting. Yeah. Uh, it we means need you have more to work times. harder probably. Yeah, maybe. And you have 28 well people taking the floor instead of 6 or 9 or 12, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, it's different. But I would say that actually uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a different exercise, but it works and, and perhaps a bit more challenging at times. But the uh, bottom line is that, uh, again, uh, because we're all united by the same uh, sense of purpose, uh, at the end, we do arrive at a, uh, a result that works for the Alliance and for all of us individually. Okay, so Christopher, it's like the astronomy of Copernicus. It may not be seem logical, but <laughs> in is. practice we've <laughs> heard works. from the ambassadors <laughs> and it works. Uh, uh, Professor Latsky, as we, we still have you, fortunately, online, uh, can I also give the opportunity to another of your students to put a question? And then I understand that now we've also got uh, Colton back on, so we can move there next. But first, let's have a, a second question, if we may, from Queen's. Excuse me, sorry, Ottawa's back online, so could Ottawa get a question? Oh, wonderful. Well, if we've okay. got you, well, I we'll come back to Queen's later. Uh, <laughs> let's then uh, please come to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to Carlton. It's good to have you with us. Sorry we couldn't have you at the beginning, but uh, hopefully your question is still uh, fresh and appropriate. So over to you, please. The, let, me, let me first dive in and uh, say uh, hello uh, to Ambassador Lute from, from myself. Uh, it's Bruce Heyman, the ambassador here in Canada, the United States ambassador. And Hello, ambassador. I'm, I'm really pleased you're doing this. Hello, how are you? And uh, we have a, a very bright group of folks here who are very engaged, and we had an offline conversation on a, on a, on a number of items that relate to NATO. But I'm gonna, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing and taking the time to do this. And uh, as, as all of you know, the U.S.-Canadian relationship is not only special but enduring and as I've said and General Dempsey actually said last week when he was here we're, uh, we're, we're, we're neighbors by geography but we're friends by choice and so the relationship we have here and the collaboration we have in NATO and other things is, is, uh, is, is by choice and we enjoy it and it's probably one of the best we have in the world. So, But let me turn it over here to uh, the folks who have all the knowledge and the questions and um, we'll pass it along. Uh, thanks, Ambassador. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Dane, are you there? And could you please introduce your students and your questions? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments. Uh, our first question will be from uh, uh, Mr. David Perry, who is a PhD student in the Department of Political Science at Carleton. Well, thank you very much again. And I want to echo the thanks for uh, putting on this event. Uh, my question, and hopefully you didn't uh, cover it when we uh, lost the video feed there, would be, given the events in Ukraine, where does that leave NATO expansion? Oh, David, that's a very good question because some argue that it should be speeded up and others argue that maybe this is a time for even more caution given Russia's assertiveness. It's a, a difficult question. Who would like to have a stab at it first? Well, let me, Ambassador Luke, please. Yeah, let me just take a stab because there's no, there's no good question yet because we're in the midst of a program, uh, about a nine-month program, to, to produce an answer to that question by the foreign ministers meeting in the last week in, um, in June. So to give you an answer today would pretend to, to know something that isn't, isn't knowable right now. Uh, what this program does, however, is put us on a track to give all four of the aspirants, that is those who have made the political decision to wish to join NATO, uh, an equal shot, uh, a level playing field uh, to meet the standards uh, by way of uh, uh, merit-based reform in their countries so that by this ministerial at the end of June, um, NATO might positively consider their candidacy. So the four countries, three in the Balkans, uh, Macedonia, uh, Bosnia, and Montenegro, uh, are joined by Georgia as the four countries that are in this program. Now, the program uh, has uh, brought all four national leaders to Brussels uh, to make a uh, sort of a cabinet-level presentation to the North Atlantic Council, where, where even I sit. Um, and it also features the international staff going out to these four capitals 
uh, in assessing very carefully their progress on political and uh, military reforms that would make them, uh, make them eligible to join. So it's too soon to tell. Uh, we'll know more uh, at the end of June. Um, I would also uh, just mention, though, that many people confuse uh, enlargement decisions as merely, solely, summit-level decisions. And in fact, the history of uh, enlargement in NATO features many, uh, a series of decisions that were taken even at the ambassador level, obviously well informed by capitals, uh, as to enlargement. So we shouldn't think that the, Na the NATO summit, the first week in September, is the only opportunity in the near term for enlargement decisions. Uh, they can be taken any time the council meets. Yeah. Uh, but we are on a program, and we'll see how it plays out by June. But yeah. I'll turn to Eve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Canada was an early advocate of NATO enlargement. Yeah, I and we well. haven't changed our mind. We're mm -hmm. still very much uh, uh, supportive of the open door policy. Actually, I would say, as are uh, all of the, the other allies. I haven't heard any uh, nation or any of my colleagues around the table basically saying that the open door policy is done and, and, and finished. Uh, uh, so uh, that's not on. Uh, and uh, as the ambassador, uh, ambassador Lute said, uh, it's work in progress, uh, uh, it's merit based, and uh, we will support it. And I think one important principle that uh, we're defending is that each nation actually uh, is free, should be free to uh, choose uh, whatever organization they want to belong to, uh, without any uh, interference from outside. So for us, uh, it's very much on the uh, on the table. Uh, we uh, we work on it. Uh, uh, nations who are husband countries are still working on it. And I think that uh, uh, at the time of the summit, we'll see uh, where that goes. If I can just build on David's question very briefly before turning to Colton for a second question. How about other countries in Europe? There's been, as you've probably seen both ambassadors and press speculation that maybe Finland and Sweden might be warming up to the, at least publicly, politically, to the notion of NATO membership. Do you, do you see that as something you, that you could possibly happen in the future? You have to ask them, I guess. <laughs> but, but again, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very much uh, their, uh, their choice. Uh, and if they express an uh, an interest, and uh, as far as I know, they haven't uh, yeah, so far. That's true. Then I think that uh, as an alliance, we, we ought to actually uh, consider the, uh, that possibility. In okay. fact, our, it's, you know, this, the same NATO uh, originating document, the Washington Treaty, the source document here, signed in 1949, has an article devoted to this. Mm -hmm. And it says that essentially that um, all democracies uh, in the North Atlantic space <coughs> are eligible. To uh, to accede to the uh, to the alliance uh, with agreement uh, among the existing mm -hmm. allies. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, in a you know sort of one sentence uh, in the Washington Treaty captures the open door policy, which as uh, Ambassador Bordeur outlined, uh, we all support it. Twenty eight. Yeah. It's really a merit based process. So David, you've heard from the ambassadors that the open door remains open. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, and again, uh, 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 Ottawa, as you were cut off and were waiting patiently, please take the opportunity if, uh, for a second question. Uh, Dane, if uh, any of the students there would like to uh, come in with a question. Over, over to you. Great. Thank you. Our second question will come from uh, Mr. Saeed Yacoub, who's going to be asking about Afghanistan. He's a PhD student in the Department of Political Science as well. I know that Ambassador Luke will be very, very glad to respond here. Uh, but, oh, side, please, your question. Uh, yeah, my, my question concerns uh, NATO's involvement in Afghanistan, particularly NATO's uh, stabilization and counterinsurgency policies. Uh, it seems that NATO uh, has not taken serious the regional cause of the problem, particularly uh, the case of Pakistan, which uh, directly supports uh, uh, regional insurgents. Uh, so my question is that uh, what NATO ha actually has learned from uh, the case of Afghanistan and how it could be useful for uh, NATO's future involvement in other uh, cases. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned that Ambassador Lute has spent a large part of your recent career on this, so uh, I naturally turn to you first then, please, Doug, and then not sure. But Canada engaged very early too, so I'm sure Eve will have a comment as well. Well, uh, my first blush response would be, you know, we're still in the midst of this lesson. So uh, lessons learned, uh, I think, are not completely formed yet. I think maybe lessons which we are learning, uh, because it's still active, uh, is probably uh, is more accurate. On my short list, let me give you a, a few. Uh, one you've actually alluded to in your question, and that is that insurgencies don't happen on islands. 
uh, typically on isolated islands. Uh, insurgencies happen in neighborhoods, uh, regional neighborhoods. Uh, one thing that I think we can take away from both the American experience, national experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan is the, uh, is the potency of the regional set and how uh, what you do in the country in question has to be, has to account for, has to take into account the regional set. Um, the second sort of first order uh, or answer that I'd give from a personal perspective is just how enormously complex these operations are. Uh, I think uh, quite candidly it's easy to, uh, to judge these as simpler than they are. Uh, and here I bring, you know, com complex issues like the demographics, the histories, the cultures, even the geography of the areas uh, have to be understood at a level that sometimes defies large uh, federal governments like the United States. Uh, but without those understandings, uh, you're likely to get it wrong. You're likely to be caught in um, misunderstandings or uh, too little appreciate uh, just how terribly complex these things are. Uh, as this is especially true when you're dealing in uh, stability operations or counterinsurgency settings that put you in close, intimate contact with the people. If you don't understand that setting, if you don't fully appreciate the language, the culture, the history, as I mentioned, then you're really at a huge disadvantage uh, compared to the insurgent who's, uh, for whom this is a home game. Uh, and that advantage, a disadvantage calculus, is, uh, ought to be taken into very serious consideration up front in the decision making, in the national and alliance decision making process. Because once you're in these operations and you're, you're confronting these complexities, it's very difficult to learn on the fly. So those are the two I take away, the regional setting and the, and the overall complexity. Uh, Ambassador, thanks, sir. Eva, I mentioned Canada was one of the earliest of the allies to engage very yeah. significantly in Afghanistan. Yeah, right. And, and we were there uh, since the very beginning of operations in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, uh, we lost 158 uh, uh, people there. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I take a little exception, I guess, with the statement that NATO did not take seriously the impact of uh, foreign, uh, I guess, uh, uh, actors uh, in the situation. I think we, we, we did. I mean, have we actually sort of uh, uh, done what, what, what we, uh, uh, we could have done or should have done? That's a different question, and I think it's a bit early for us to pass judgment on that. What I can tell you, though, is that, you know, again, uh, and uh, by the way, I was actually responsible for the Afghanistan Task Force, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs of Canada, for two years. Um, uh, the, the internal problem of Afghanistan uh, probably have a, a really direct connection with uh, what's happening outside uh, in the region. Uh, but the bottom line is that it's a problem that is internal to Afghanistan as well. So uh, yes, you could uh, probably actually sort of uh, spend some time uh, dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the forces that are uh, fueling this uh, from outside. Uh, but uh, the, there, there was a lot of work uh, to be done inside, and there's still a lot of work to be done inside. Uh, reinforcing good governance, uh, uh, trying to actually uh, curb corruption, helping uh, uh, the Afghans to have a decent life, uh, life sorry, uh, protecting their freedoms and their rights. Uh, this will all help, I think, to actually perhaps uh, curb and diminish the importance or the, the attractiveness of what's coming from outside. So there's work to be done uh, there as well. And a uh, uh, very personal uh, reflection here, but I think that uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the elections uh, now uh, moving to the second uh, round, uh, and uh, I think that Afghanistan will be better off with a president as soon as possible uh, that can actually sort of uh, roll uh, his sleeves and get to work on these issues. And that will help uh, tremendously, uh, I think. Ambassador, you thank, thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Syed, for that question. I see that inevitably the clock ticks very fast uh, during this type of program. Uh, is it possible to have a connection with the, the Monk School? Because we haven't heard from them yet. Are they uh, uh, on the line listening, but are they also able to speak to us? Monk School, are you there, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Is it's that Alex Wilner? We were told we were only listening in. And no, uh, Alex, uh, p fortunately, the, the miracles of technology have worked. So, uh, and we don't want to leave you out. So please go ahead with your questions, uh, either from yourself or from any students that are with you. 
Okay, well, first of all, thanks uh, very much for uh, inviting us. This is, let me repeat the, the thanks that you received from the other moderators at these different universities. Um, and let me also, with a caveat, that we missed the first 30 minutes. So if we're repeating something that's already been said, we apologize. Uh, we do have a question from one of our Masters of Global Affairs students, uh, Khalid Madi, who will ask a question on uh, counterproliferation. Oh, no, Please. well, that, that certainly has not been uh, covered yet, Alex. So that, that falls providentially well. Please uh, uh, go ahead, Khalid, please. There, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clearly. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, I mean, this is the question to uh, both um, both ambassadors. Um, with NATO-Russian relations somewhat tarnished following the events in Crimea, and with Russia a key player in, you know, global nuclear arms reduction, what impact do you anticipate these events will have on NATO's contribution to international efforts in the area of disarmament and non-proliferation? And what role do you anticipate NATO being able to play in facilitating this process and ensuring that further cuts in nuclear arms continue as planned? Thank you for that very interesting question. Uh, who would like to take it first? Well, let me take Ambassador Salem. So I think it's important to remember that even in the face of the ongoing crisis in, uh, in uh, the East, in, in and around Ukraine, that NATO and Russia do retain uh, some topics of common interest. I mean, you could start with counterterrorism. You could start. You could add to that uh, stability in Afghanistan and Central Asia, and I think you could add to it the uh, the topics of your question. I mean, neither of us have uh, neither. I would put it positively. We both have uh, very affirmative interests in uh, controlling the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and and frankly, we believe we have an equal interest in arms control. Uh, now. The challenge is that while you have this sort of positive agenda on the ledger uh, where you have common interests, uh, those tend to get interrupted and sidetracked and sometimes dislodged by the negative uh, agenda items and the immediacy of the kind of crisis that we're facing now in Ukraine. Now, what NATO's done with regard to Russia is say, uh, essentially, look, we've got work to do here on Ukraine. It's urgent and immediate work. Uh, we're going to proceed with that. Uh, we hope we find a partner in you in moving forward on that agenda. And we're not going to close the door, however, on those items on the other side of the ledger. So the door is open for counterterrorism, for counterproliferation, for arms control. Uh, a good case in point is the work that continues today to, uh, to remove uh, the, the chemical weapons out of Syria. So, you know, largely out of the eye of the public, while the Ukraine crisis has spiked, um, we have also now, I think the last data I saw was something like 90% complete in removing serious chemical weapons. That could not have been done without NATO-Russia cooperation. So you've got to be able to sort of, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time here and appreciate that as well, and differentiate right? between yeah. the two parts yeah. of the account. Uh, and even where you disagree on some items, like we'll certainly disagree over Russian, uh, Russian behavior in Ukraine, uh, we can still leave the door open and ideally still continue to make progress on other things. And President Obama, of course, continues to push on nuclear safety, the big meeting recently in The Hague and bringing in all of the international partners. So exactly there's a lot right. going on, of course, Ambassador, outside the traditional U.S.-Russia framework right. as well. Yeah. That's right. Any thoughts on that, Ambassador? No, Mario? I think it was really good answer. So well, to well brevity also helps us to have more questions. Uh, Monk, uh, as we've miraculously got you, uh, let me also take advantage by asking if there is a second question from a student there, please. We do. Thank you. We do have a second question. Uh, a second student from the Masters in Global Affairs program, Robert Denneberg, has a question. Uh, good afternoon, Hi Robert. Hi there. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Um, a couple months ago, actually, I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Bob Davidson, and he was suggesting that Canada had an interest in expanding the scope of NATO without necessarily expanding its membership. Uh, from your guys' experience on the inside, is that something that members will likely be able to reach a consensus on, or are you know, members' interests outside of their own common security too divided to actually reach some kind of consensus on where they can act um, out, outside of the NATO scope? Thanks, Robert. You specifically mentioned Canada there, so I'll turn, of course, to Ambassador Bruder. Yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, I don't know what uh, Admiral Davidson uh, told you exactly, and I'm sure I fully understand the question. So uh, I, I, I think, and, and you tell me if I'm uh, uh, getting it wrong, uh, that uh, uh, basically we're talking about partnerships here and trying to actually uh, extend our reach uh, to uh, partners who can uh, assist NATO and can bring something. To Is that more or less what you're, what you're asking for? Robert, you want to come I mean, back I, in and I clarify? 
from what uh, from what I understood, that, uh, he was saying to me is that you know, like the the uh, mission in Afghanistan, you know, Afghanistan obviously not um, part and um, just kind of doing uh, carrying out missions for security that aren't um, threats necessarily to NATO countries. Uh, okay, I get it. Dealing with problems Quite beyond the immediate sort yeah. of we're, we're defensive talking about interest. Uh, crisis management to yeah. some extent, and yeah. and, uh, and the the contribution that NATO can make mm -hmm. uh, to try and yeah. solve these uh, these uh, these problems or these these challenges. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, one of the uh, part of the answer, it's not all of it, and uh, is basically uh, uh, that NATO is is a place where uh, that we share, we have in common certain practices, certain way of doing business. Uh, we understand each other. We have standards which are common to all NATO allies, but only to NATO allies. We have more and more partners who are actually training, exercising with us, who understand how we work. So that, uh, in a way, I guess NATO is, is a force multiplier. If you take the example of, of uh, 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 Republic Centrafricaine uh, uh, and the uh, sorry, at Mali, uh, getting confused here, and the uh, French operation in, in Mali, uh, which was supported by a number of uh, NATO allies, including Canada. Uh, and and uh, the reason why it happened, uh, uh, and I, it was interesting to listen, for instance, to the uh, French Minister of, De of Defense, Mr. Le Drian, saying that actually a lot of it uh, actually was possible because we we're all working uh, uh, according to the same script, uh, which is a NATO script, essentially how you uh, uh, interact. We call that interoperability in, in the jargon here. Uh, so there's a big plus here, and I think that actually the more we train with partners, the more uh, the nations we bring into the fold, uh, the more we exercise with them, then the greater the possibilities for us to interact with uh, these nations uh, in uh, in crises which are not necessarily uh, will not, which will not necessarily involve NATO directly, less, uh, like in Mali, it was not a NATO operation, but where NATO allies can individually, on a bilateral basis, offer support to another ally uh, to conduct a mission using the, the NATO uh, uh, framework, and and uh, and I think that's a big plus. So uh, we can build on that, and it's already happening, and I think that you will see more of that. Okay. Uh, uh, ambassadors uh, uh, and universities, I'm looking at the, the, the watch, and our time is almost up, so uh, if you will allow me, I'd like to ask uh, each of you the same sort of concluding question, which also I hopefully builds on the questions that we had from our universities uh, today. Uh, both of you mentioned the Wales Summit uh, uh, as the next sort of, key milestone for NATO and summits <coughs> of course don't take place in NATO every week so they are special events and all of us, uh, each of us, we all have uh, a boss that we work for. For me it's the Secretary General, I know Ambassador Lute is President Obama uh, and Prime Minister Harper of course Ambassador Broder in your case and what would you think uh, your bosses as they get on the plane and travel back home to North America after the Wales Summit, what would they want to see as the kind of the minimum of achievements of, of Wales from a, a Canadian perspective, a US perspective, so they would fly home thinking, well, you know, basically the Alliance is moving in a direction that, that, that we want. Can I maybe turn Eve sure. to you first? Uh, yes. what, what would be your sort of expectations of success? Thank you. Well, uh, I don't want to put myself in Prime Minister <laughs> Harper's shoes, but uh, yeah. uh, I think that what he would want to see uh, after the, the Wales Summit is a NATO that is actually uh, uh, committed uh, to the defense of our values, uh, uh, which are basically the bedrock of this organization, uh, which is uh, uh, ready to, uh, to act uh, uh, where uh, and when needed, and uh, has the resolve to do it uh, politically. And, and in a way, I guess, the Wales Summit, uh, uh, perhaps because of uh, the, the current circumstances, but only because of that, but uh, that's a big element. Uh, will be an opportunity for leaders to sit down really and think about uh, uh, what is this organization doing for them, for our uh, citizens, uh, and to promote, defend the values that uh, we, we, uh, we have in common and that are uh, uh, so defining for us. Uh, and I think that actually is uh, the answer that the Prime Minister will be looking for. Thanks. Ambassador so I'm at, at a bit of a, uh, an advantage here because uh, President Obama actually answered this question uh, just a couple weeks ago when he was here, so, uh, yeah. so it's a, yeah, it's a good question. And actually, he used the same term that, uh, that Yves Brodeur just used, and that is that the Alliance for the United States is the bedrock of security. It's where security starts for the United States. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the U.S. pivot to Asia. Well, one has to pivot from a base. Uh, President Obama, yes, you know, we should all remember, is a basketball player, yeah. right? So and in basketball, uh, when you one pivots, uh, he, that player retains one foot in place uh, and then changes direction, uh, reorients, but one, the pivot foot, stays in place. 
the pivot foot for America in security terms is NATO. Uh, and of course, in basketball, if you lift your pivot foot, mm -hmm. it's a violation and the ball goes to the other team. Uh, America is not going to lift its pivot foot here uh, on, uh, on security. And that is fundamentally the foundation, the bedrock for America is security. So when he leaves the summit, I think he's going to want to be reassured mm -hmm. that, uh, that America is making its rightful contribution to security at 28, and the others are doing likewise. Ambassadors, thank you very much. Uh, universities, thank you so much for participating today. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't have uh, time for even more questions, but I do congratulate you on the excellent questions that you did ask. And I think also here in Brussels, we're very encouraged that clearly, uh, both in Canada and the United States, uh, universities are interested in NATO and international security. It's because you obviously have fantastic professors, but you also have great students. And hopefully we can have this dialogue again in the future. The hour has given us a very good tour d'horizon uh, of NATO uh, issues. Uh, and let me conclude also by thanking uh, the U.S. mission here and the Canadian delegation to NATO and all of the excellent people uh, for putting together uh, today's program. I hope you found it as uh, informative and as useful uh, as I did, uh, and I had the privilege uh, to moderate this. So uh, from Brussels to all of you, uh, uh, a very pleasant afternoon and pleasant evening to ourselves. And again, as I say, hopefully we can do it again before too long. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.